Welcome back to another Sound Truth interview. I'm your host, Adam Miller. And today we're talking about a subject that I think is incredibly important. It's something that we emphasize quite a bit here on our broadcast because we believe how important it is for us to have the gospel at the core of everything that we do as followers of Christ. It is essential that we understand that the gospel is not just our ticket to heaven. It is something that is walking us through every phase of our life and bringing us all the way to the throne room in heaven where we will worship the lamb who was slain for all eternity. So I'm really excited to be joined by our guest today, uh, Mitch Chase, who is the author of this this great book. And I'd, I'd like to say it's a new book, but really it's a new edition of an older book, but it's called The Gospel is for Christians. And uh, this is an excellent title. It's really straight to the point, but uh, Mitch, thank you so much for being a part of the Many Voices for that one message. Well, thank you, Adam. I'm glad to be with you to talk. Why don't you get started by telling us a little bit about yourself and um, what drew you to the subject of the book? I mean, the subject is pretty simple. You put it right there in, in the title of your book. It's pretty self-explanatory that the gospel is for Christians. What yeah. is it that kind of was the light bulb moment for you that made you realize how important it is for Christians to hold to and cling to the gospel? I grew up in a church. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church in South Texas, and uh, I've been around preaching and singing of hymns and uh, talk about the Bible <clears throat> all my life. It's been uh, the environment in which I was reared, and it's easy for uh, somebody to be a part of churches over the years, and so much is assumed about what people would know or assumed of what would be clear and what's clearly believed. And I know I was surrounded by people who knew the gospel and believed the gospel. And um, I remember uh, in my high school into college transition, uh, there were a number of light bulbs going off about the seriousness of discipleship for somebody who claims to know God. And, uh, and I felt like a, a missing piece for my own understanding, my own paradigm <clears throat> about what discipleship should be grounded in uh, was really something not, not only late into my college uh, years, but in early seminary, where a lot of emphasis was happening about gospel centrality, that Jesus, the cross, all of this was so crucial for the Christian life. And uh, not only did, did that resonate deeply with me, Adam, um, I realized that this is something that all Christians and all churches uh, need to have a renewal of joy and commitment to. This message that we know saves sinners, but also is crucial for the disciples of Jesus Christ. And uh, so when I was in, in Texas and now living in Louisville, Kentucky, um, I've been a part of churches and church ministry. Uh, I've seen firsthand how important it is for Christians to clearly understand and commit to the message of the gospel for their discipleship. Mm. I think it's so important for us because, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home too. You know, my dad was a pastor. I was always there. You know, I was saved at a very young age. And it's easy to kind of feel like we've grown past the gospel. Like it, mm. it's the kind of elementary school and we've got to move on to other things. But that's really not the case, is it? It's really not. We, uh, we want to emphasize that unbelievers need to believe this good news about Jesus who bore their sins, that in him is pardon from sin and everlasting life. And, and yet to follow Jesus, we don't leave this, this uh, classroom because it's not just a mere classroom. It's the whole facility or compound of the Christian life. And so as we mature, as we grow in wisdom in the Lord, we find that we will find that the gospel, the cross of Jesus, his love for us in the new covenant. These are truths that deepen in our hearts over time. Uh, they're, they're not things that we want to move away from in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I think we will find that as we devote ourselves to the word and to the sound preaching and teaching of scripture, our hearts will come to love the gospel afresh. And we may find ourselves many years into our lives as believers understanding more and appreciating more about the person and work of Christ than we ever could have when we started. How, how would we have had so much clarity or so much uh, um, understood in our minds? We were new, new believers. And, and so the gospel becomes the journey we're on, the good news to learn and understand and proclaim and hold to. And uh, so truly, we don't leave it behind. It, it becomes crucial to our path as a disciple. You mentioned there's a lot of assumptions that we make about the gospel. Um, we assume it a lot of ways, and that's that's probably one of the most dangerous things that we have within our Christian community is that we we think we've got the gospel nailed down, but we really don't. Mm. 
That's so true. I feel like the um, the kinds of survey questions you could ask folks, you know, what what did Jesus accomplish? Uh, what does it mean to be saved? Um, uh, what is our what is our only hope for forgiveness of sins? We might be shocked, especially as Americans, to see the kinds of answers that are very focused on works righteousness or a um, uh, an emphasis on Jesus being a good example or teacher for us, and really missing some core elements about his identity, about the finished work of atonement on the cross, and what that means as a sufficient grounds for our justification. As, as Christians. Um, um, we we realize not all of this is clear to us when we first want to follow Jesus. Uh, we understand some important things about what he's done to be a real believer in Jesus. Uh, we want to believe true things. And yet that's just scratching the surface of the glories of the person and work of Jesus. And uh, and if, if we're not if we're not committing ourselves as disciples to grow in the soundness of the gospel and uh, to preach the good news to ourselves and to be a part of a community of faith that loves the gospel, then uh, not only are we going to be embracing false assumptions, in the end, we might find ourselves not really understanding the core message of the gospel at all. Yeah, I think one of the ways I, I'm, I'm going to say this again, my, our listeners have heard me say this so many times, they're probably rolling their eyes at this point, but we're so familiar with the gospel. like. I say we're a lot like uh, Christian turkeys. We say gospel, 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 gospel. <laughs> but we never actually articulate it. Like we, we talk about it. We're, we're circling around it, but we're not actually getting into it. Um, mm -hmm. we, whenever you read through the Bible, you see that the gospel is uh, articulated in the New Testament. You know, Paul in particular brings it out all of the time. He unfolds the gospel. It doesn't just reference it. That's important for us to actually work through it, not just to assume that we've got it figured out. That's right. The New Testament authors not only preached the gospel uh, to the churches that were being founded by Paul and the apostles, you see in their letters that they are writing to the professing saints an emphasis on the gospel, the things that they heard already that they're bringing to mind again, the things that they had passed on to them, the traditions about Christ that they needed to be more grounded in. And they're writing to churches that have a myriad of issues, all sorts of moral issues or unity matters. And, and I don't think we should be surprised that one of the key strategies for the apostles is to bring them back to the good news of the gospel of Christ and how that has a wonderful effect on reorienting our lives because of what it does to our hearts and minds and the overflow effect that that will have for our churches. The, the, apostles, the, the apostles think the gospel is for Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of these areas I've seen over and over again is the kind of mental disconnect I think that we make where we, we, we say, well, the gospel is for unbelievers. The gospel is for winning people to salvation. Uh, but this is something I have to do in order to kind of work on my sanctification. And there's that disconnect there where it's really hard. And I've had this conversation so many times that I can see like the, there's, a, there's a bit of a barrier for people to get past in this understanding that the gospel is working out other aspects, not just uh, winning somebody to Christ. Yeah, I think that's right. When you when you see these uh, apostles emphasizing what they do in their letters, they don't want their readers to think about the Christian life as something that starts with the gospel, and then it becomes just all about your striving, your efforts, your hard work. Uh, I'm thinking about Colossians 1.23, for example, where Paul is talking about um, how God is reconciled uh, in his body of flesh by his death, uh, sinners who were alienated. And he says in verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. The, the gospel centrality for the Christian life is what shows us to be those who truly are believers in the Lord, who are holding to the faith. That's what we are confessing. We should not shift from it. That shapes our discipleship. Mm. I think in one way, you know, Christians, when we assume the gospel, we, we know kind of the basic steps. Like, I think, I think the average Christian in the church today could walk somebody through the sinner's prayer, for instance, and getting them to make a confession of faith. Hmm. But that is not the gospel. And when you ask somebody, what is the gospel, they might actually stumble a little bit. Do right. people actually know what the gospel is so that they can even uh, live by the gospel? There are plenty of assumptions 
of an Americanized version of Christianity where people can be familiar with, um, you know, judge not from Matthew 7, 1, or even John 3, 16. And so the name Jesus might not be unfamiliar to people, but there might be just enough familiarity to not be helpful because the content is missing. The substance is not clear. And when we're talking with folks uh, around us, we, sh we should just not assume that they have a working common understanding about why Jesus matters for us, about why the cross and resurrection uh, are good news for the earth. And, uh, and so I think we need to press onto people. Here's what the Bible teaches about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and the fulfillment of hopes that were laid out so many centuries before him. There, we've got a whole counsel of God to help us exalt Jesus. And uh, that's just going to take time. We might uh, we might be convinced that look, you know, if somebody just gave me two or three minutes, I can I can uh, share the gospel with them, and that'll be sufficient. And and really, we want follow up conversations and lengthier uh, dialogue with folks because there is there's so many misunderstandings to clear away, so many good questions that need to be answered. We, we can't just share the gospel as a pattern with sound bites with our beloved neighbors and family and friends. We need to be patient and think long term and really invest in, uh, in areas of understanding that are deeply lacking. Biblical illiteracy is so prominent in our land. And, uh, and therefore, an implication of this would be the gospel is not clearly understood. Mm. You mentioned it's the good news. I mean, that's kind of the big component. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people overlook. Like we think the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross. It's mm. the action that he did, but it's actually the news. It's the announcement. Explain that to us and why that's important the distinction to make. Yeah. So the apostles turned the world upside down from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth by bringing good news of great joy for all people, as the angels declared in Luke 2, that, uh, that what God is doing is sending a savior so that the death on the cross and resurrection from the dead are news for people who need mercy and don't deserve it, who have sins crushing them, a burden of transgression that will be a reaping of what we have sown, a reaping of judgment. And the good news of Jesus is that we need not perish. God has sent a substitute, a faithful savior that we might look to him in faith, receive with the open hands of faith what he has done for us. And the reason that's good news for sinners is because the news of Jesus changes us, makes us new. We become worshipers of the living Christ, followers of him to our last breath. Mm. And that, that's the news that really provokes a lot of change in us because it's an announcement uh, to all of us. I mean, we're, we're sinners. We're, uh, our, our, our punishment for sin is death. I mean, I've had a lot of people, you know, uh, up here sharing the gospel and they talk a lot about the bad news, but we got to yeah. get to the good news component is that what Christ has done for us is, is sufficient. As, uh, as Paul says in Romans, right? It was the propitiation. It was the satisfaction for that. that that's, that's the news that we need to get to. And oftentimes I think that we get bogged down in the, the bad news component that we'd actually don't get to the good news. Yeah. I, I and I love that you put it that way, Adam, um, the compelling mercy, love, and kindness of Jesus towards sinners. It's abundantly clear in the Gospels. You see it on display in all four Gospels. And I think in our, in our Gospel uh, sharing with folks, we want them to understand that they are in need of a Savior. But we must eagerly and passionately and pleadingly hold forth the greatness of Christ, who calls us to repent from sin and enter into a life of knowing him with wisdom and joy and peace with God, which is the life we want, which is the life we were made for, but we're so convinced of the promises of sin and so suspicious of the claims of Christ, um, really we have switched the truth for a lie. And, uh, and we, in our, in our folly and in our delusions about things, uh, we need, we need gospel loving people to come alongside of us and extol before our hearts and minds, the greatness and goodness of Jesus, because of his compelling personality and ways and wisdom, it was clear in his ministry. And, and I hope it would be clear in his ministers in the 21st century. 
I want to talk specifically about how this gospel is for Christians. We see it, obviously, as you mentioned, in the Gospels and in the New Testament as it's kind of expounded for us. And we, we see this even in our own studies of the Old Testament, pointing to the Gospel, pointing to this story and how it all is this unique narrative pointing to the cross and the resurrection of Christ. But how is it specifically for Christians? What do Christians benefit from the Gospel more than just their salvation? Yes. So the gospel, um, it, in a big picture, we can say that the work of Jesus on the cross and through the resurrection, he is sealing for us a new covenant, a relationship, an arrangement in which we are eternally secure. So this is not something that just is for us coming into salvation and conversion. In fact, we remain, we abide in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So all of a sudden, this good news is something that's now the banner of my Christian life. I've been brought into, I've been reconciled into and adopted into a new covenant, a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, my whole Christian life is union with Christ. And the implications of this are still felt as, uh, as, as believers in the midst of a fallen world. We can, we can think on the love of God for us in Christ. We can think of our security and assurance that we have in his person and work. Because even as, as Christians, we can have doubts about um, our lives. We can, we can feel the weight of guilt for decisions that we have made. We can still feel impulses that we need to earn the approval of others, earn the approval of God. And the gospel holds out Jesus to us, the good news of who he is and what he has done. And we can rest in that. Uh, there is a joyful, cheerful rest that we can in, abide in, in uh, as Christians. We don't do so perfectly, which is why we always need the gospel. Mm. You know, I see this a lot in, in uh, uh, kind of the sort of attractional preaching that is very common in our culture today, where we want to hear messages about, you know, marriage and parenting and work and how to be a better employee or how to, how to be more profitable. And, you know, the, all of these seem to center around the idea of, you know, your best, the best version of yourself, the best life now. And those are the things that are so common within our culture. They're very attractive to us. And I find it unique that when the Apostle Paul in particular talks about these things, and even Peter does it, where he's talking about family, he always applies the principle of the gospel, right? Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. It's That's tied right. to the gospel. All of these elements are really the best life now is really somehow tied to the gospel in conformity to Christ. Yes, that's a that's a great insight, Adam. I, I think as, as believers, um, we want to see the gospel as not a minor or small peripheral component to the other things about discipleship that we're trying to pursue with these other areas, very practical areas, marriage or work or raising children, uh, or just thinking about personal growth and patience and self-control. Um, the gospel is the kind of thing that, that with it being central, it affects everything else. It's like everything in life orbiting around something in a galaxy. If you have the good news of Jesus as your heart's delight, and you want to grow in it and love the Christ of the gospel and learn it from the word of God and with the community of the saints. I think what we will find, Adam, is that this good news impacts all the other areas of our lives that we need not focus on to the neglect of the gospel, but actually are impacted by our growing love for Jesus. Mm. And I think when we start to apply the gospel and that the key there is conformity to Christ, uh, the, the goal in, in preaching the gospel and teaching the gospel and reading the gospel is that our, our chief end is to glorify God and to be more like Christ. And in this regard, that is the gospel's work uh, to teach us that, right? The, the news, the announcement of what Christ has done is causing us to stop and look at Christ, and that is going to affect us. In That's some so way, if we stop and look at Christ, look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we can't not be changed. We will either be hardened or we'll be conformed, right? That's right. We all want to recognize our need for growth, our, our need to um, Im improve in areas that are frustrating to us, to cultivate virtues of Christian living. And yet the, the power of change comes from the person and work of Christ by the spirit applied to our hearts. And, and as we behold Christ, 
that affects us. And the gospel is the message that holds out Christ to us from Genesis to Revelation, preparing the way for Christ and then announcing his arrival. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached. So he gave them the gospel and he says, now you hold to the gospel, stand in the gospel. You're being saved even now, uh, which, which uh, pictures the, the sanctifying work of Christ in our hearts unto that last day. We need the gospel for all of it. And uh, the Christian life is along that path, not a, a starting line we leave behind, but the very road we walk unto glory. Mm. You mentioned this already um, in passing, and uh, you've written a great chapter on it in your book, uh, preaching the gospel to yourself. This is something we talk about a lot here, mm. and yet I think it's something that is so abstract, it's really hard for people to wrap their minds around. I've actually said it so many times that I've kind of gotten lost in my own words, and people have said, what do you mean by that? So <laughs> I'm not going to answer them, you're going to answer them. So what yeah. do we mean when we say preach the gospel to yourself? Yeah, so I'm thinking about a discipline of, of knowing that between the Lord's Day services that we ought to be a part of as believers, growing in Christ in the community of the saints, we've, we've got the day-to-day -day battles of spiritual warfare and indwelling sin and the snares of the evil one around us. And, and our hearts need to be oriented every day. We don't necessarily wake up in the morning feeling like the saints of Jesus Christ set apart as holy, ready to take the day for the glory of God. And instead, you know, we might wake up completely out of sorts and mind and body. We might have all sorts of burdens and stresses from the week that are reaching earlier on in the morning to get our attention and focus. And, and we can find our hearts weakened and wearied and frail and even more uh, easily sinful and wicked and selfish. What I need is to be freed from the captivity of the concerns of this world that would consume my attention and direct my, my emotions and my life and my heart. What I need is to think about Jesus. I need to think about the goodness of the word and the gospel. I need to think about what he's done for me and his love for me. And I need to spend the, these moments thinking about my rest in Jesus. I need to think about my forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins that is true every day, mercy that I wake up into every day. And by, by marinating our minds in the good news of the gospel for the Christian, the love of Christ has, has an effect on our hearts that's between the Lord's Day services. We certainly need the gospel when we meet together in corporate worship. We need the sound preaching and teaching of the word. But I need the gospel on Monday, and, and maybe especially on Monday, <laughs> and uh, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And, and so the gospel for the daily uh, life of the believer, um, we, we think about it often in terms of preaching it to ourself. It's turning my heart uh, again, afresh, to the person and work of Jesus. Yeah. You know, if the gospel is for Christians, who's the Christian we know that needs it the most? It's going to be me, right? That's right. And I think sometimes that's the idea is that we think that preaching is for other people. We, we're very external focused, especially, you know, when we're thinking about who really needs to hear this message. I can think of a few people in my mind who really need to hear this conversation we're having, right. <laughs> but, but it's really, it's really for me, I, the, the person that I know the most and, and the person that I know that has offended God the most is me. Hmm. I need to preach the gospel to that person. And that, that means that if the gospel is for Christians and the gospel is first and foremost to me, not only for me to preach it to myself, but me to surround people in my life and, and programs and conversations that will speak that into my soul as well. Yeah, that's right. It makes me think of the parable in Mark chapter four, where Jesus is uh, talking about the sowing of the word on the soil. And we want to have hearts of fertile soil, eagerly receiving the kingdom message of Jesus because of what that means for our lives and our allegiance. And, and sometimes even as preachers, I can recognize this tendency uh, since I'm a local pastor here in Louisville. Um, we, might, we might think of ourselves or even other evangelists thinking of themselves as, well, we're sowers of the word. You know, so when Jesus talks about somebody sowing the word, you know, we're doing that work. But long before we're a sower of the word, 
we're first of all a soil. How have how has our heart received the kingdom message of Jesus, who He is and what He's done and what He's come to fulfill, and uh, and we need those those uh, hearts of fertile soil, the good soil where there is a root that is taken and then fruit that results in our lives of faithfulness. Mm. You know, I've said this a lot, and uh, I think you would agree that you know we're the ones who need the gospel, and we need to hear it, and we need other people to preach it to us. Then we also need to be that preaching to the Christians and our other brothers and sisters, encouraging them with the gospel. But I also find that what's really valuable to this is if you're struggling with evangelism, if you're struggling with sharing your faith with an unbeliever, uh, when you've preached the gospel yourself on a regular basis and you've preached the gospel and you've articulated that gospel with another believer, it's second nature to have that mm. conversation with an unbeliever that you've mm. just gotten to the point where you're so comfortable talking about what Christ has done and what Christ is doing in your yes. life that it becomes an overflow. And, and for a lot of people that I think that are intimidated, intimidated about sharing their faith, it really starts here, doesn't it? I love the way you put that. I think that's absolutely right. And that's a crucial evangelistic insight for the lost, because as we as we speak out loud about what Jesus has done and articulate the power of his kingdom message and work, we are absolutely uh, creating pathways in our minds and in our speech that we can more easily travel with an unbeliever. And uh, it's it's like it's like seeing um, where an animal might walk in there in, the, in somebody's backyard. You can see the well-worn paths along the grass or the dirt and uh, and you can more easily see them traveling on that. It's a worn path. And uh, the positive way of taking that with our gospel meditation is that we want those well-worn paths of our minds and hearts to be accomplished by the gospel. And we're right then and there during those times, we're preparing ourselves for those gospel opportunities. We will be more easily uh, prepared for and more apt to share what Christ has done. But this also, of course, requires that the gospel is clear to us. So Adam, part of what I wonder is if, if, if folks are very reluctant to share their faith, if they don't really speak about the gospel, even with other believers to encourage them, I would, I would then wonder, first of all, how clear is the gospel to them? How much do they understand about it? And how meaningful is it to their discipleship? It might need to be clarified. They might need to further find delight and hope in the gospel they profess. And I think as they do so and fill their heart with the joy that is found in Christ of this gospel, it will overflow more naturally in their relationships. I was uh, recently with a, a group of believers in a corporate prayer meeting, and uh, I was leading it, and I, I encouraged them as we were kind of bringing our time to a close to, to pray the gospel. And we prayed in a circle, keep it short, pray the gospel. And someone said, what's that? Um, mm -hmm. And it really kind of caught me off guard because, I mean, for me, that was just a normal expression. We, I've said it a million times before. And I, I, I stumbled, like, what do I mean when I say that? Well, we sing the gospel. We, 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 we participate in, in kind of when we come to the Lord's table, we're enacting the gospel in some way. So what do, what do we mean by when we're talking about the gospel and, and practicing the gospel? What are those elements? Because that's a kind of an eye-opening moment when you realize that really we have marked throughout our Christian worship all these elements of the gospel, but we might not be perceptive enough to pick up on it. For sure. And I think that we can um, we can lay out a number of elements that are part of the news we believe as Christians. So if I'm responding to the news by turning from my sin and believing in Jesus, what is it about his person and work that needs to be clear in my mind? And we need to think about how Christ is truly human and truly divine, that he is the perfect son of God who came to taste death on our behalf, and that he lived a life without sin. Crucial to the news of the gospel is that I'm a sinner, and I needed someone who was not like me in that way, who could do for me what I needed done and could never have done myself. I need to think about the culmination of his earthly ministry into the cross and resurrection from the dead. But uh, Adam, often what can be omitted is what happens after the resurrection as good news. The good news of the ascension is a joyful affirmation for the Christian. Christ, even now, 
reigns at the right hand of God. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he is submitting, uh, he is subjecting all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. So we have a living Christ who reigns with all authority in heaven and earth. And the ascended Christ intercedes for us. And by his perfect high priestly work, we come not to a throne of judgment, but to a throne of grace for help in time of need. And so when we pray, and we recognize that we're coming in the name of Jesus, we're coming because of a gospel-shaped reality. I'm coming because of what Jesus has done. The Lord hears my prayers because I'm united to Christ Jesus. I can rejoice in not only what he's done, but what he will accomplish at his return. The good news can uh, fill our hearts with great encouragement and help in time of need as we incorporate elements like this into our prayers and into our speech. I think it's important for us to recognize those as distinctively gospel because uh, it's very easy for us. And I've, I've actually given this task to some people, some assignments, and some of our listeners might actually uh, take this challenge on themselves as well, uh, to read through one of the epistles and to take note of how many times the gospel is explicitly referenced or articulated. And you can't go very far. I mean, it's the opening of, of uh, Ephesians, right? It's the whole kind of discourse that opens up. And yeah. it's in all of the elements of, of the application of, of, of marriage and, and family, of children, of, of, of spouse and, and employer and employee relationships. It, when, you, when you start to actually see it on every page, that's kind of eye-opening, isn't it? It really is. When I think about the Apostle Paul addressing all the different matters that he did, whether it was to the Corinthians or whether it was to the Romans, people that he knew personally, people that he was hoping to one day meet and fund his mission, um, this Apostle recognized that they all had in common what was being received and taught that impacted these, these uh, various realms of life. And by orienting their minds to the gospel, it would do good for their fruitful Christian lives. They needed reminding. They needed instruction. When I think about 1 Corinthians 15 again, he says that um, they have received what he passed on to them. We all need to remember that as Christians, we don't come uh, into this Christian life, converted into the Lord Jesus, having everything clear already about who Jesus is and what he's done, as much as we will need further explanation and application, we need instruction. The first century Christians were that way. So we need to be those willing to receive further guidance and training and discipleship. Uh, after all, Jesus didn't say to his disciples, go and make, you know, initial converts uh, of the nations and, you know, stop there, uh, move on. Instead, he wants them to make disciples who are confessing and growing and learning what is being taught. They've been baptized and they themselves are disciple makers afterward. And, and, uh, and yeah, so this gospel that we are about, it, it impacts churches, ethnic backgrounds, countries, languages, no matter the span of time and culture, it's this ever-present, ever-relevant message of God's saving grace in Christ from our conversion and to our entrance into glory. Mm. And I, I love how you point that out. And especially as you, this book, it really gives insight into, I, I mean, we, we talked about each of us having this kind of aha moment, our light bulb going off and starting to see it there. It's kind of like the thing that's hidden in plain sight that you've seen so many times i also also say this in the gospel in some ways is like white noise you know yeah. always there but you don't really pay attention to it and when you when it's you don't realize it until it's gone right that it's that's not there anymore and yeah you need to really hone in on that because it is the most important component in the bible and if we're not seeing it we really need to step back and, and get into that to where we're actually able to pull out those principles in our in our devotions, in our daily Bible reading, but also even in, in our own sermons and in our listening to sermons and the songs that we sing. We need to be able to identify it and so that it can actually see how that's affecting our soul. That's so true, Adam. I like how you described it as a light bulb moment, because when when somebody has a paradigm shift like this, and even if they have backgrounds of, uh, of church ministry and, and growth from uh, childhood upward, like you, like me, um, you can still have that light bulb moment where you realize what feels like for the first time, how important and all consuming the message is. 
It doesn't necessarily mean you weren't a Christian, but it's because the Lord deals with us graciously in stages of understanding and insight and illuminating our hearts and minds. And we can realize something for the first time that feels like a born again experience. You know, I've known people who who um, they come to to grasp afresh the wonders of the gospel and, and, and they think, you know, I feel like I'm just becoming a Christian all over again. Like just the glories of knowing these things about Jesus that I'm learning now at this stage. It's a wonderful thing. And I love to see it happen for people. I was in my 20s when it had happened with me. And I see the, the fruitfulness of the message of the gospel doing this for Christian after Christian. And it enlivens their, their Christian discipleship and gives them such strength for perseverance. Mm. I think that's great. And I, I really do hope that, I mean, I'm sure that there are people listening uh, to our conversation that are having that moment where it's finally starting to click. It's finally starting to come true. And I'm just excited for them because when they read the Bible, it's just going to come alive in new ways. Amen. And, uh, you know, one of the ways I think that we can assist that is not just in talking about it, but praying for it. Could I, could I encourage you to pray for that end, that, that the gospel would be come alive more and more to us each and every day. And uh, even now for someone who's listening to have their eyes open to this wonderful truth that's on every page of scripture. Let's do that. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray for, first of all, any listeners who, who do not have hearts that love Christ and, and that the gospel has not been clear to them and uh, their hearts have not been pursuing uh, you as the hope for their souls and the refuge from judgment. Lord, I pray that you will work by your spirit uh, through things that have been said here and elsewhere to open their hearts and minds to new life in Jesus and that they would turn from sin, that their heart would have hope and trust in the Savior of sinners whose name is Jesus. And we pray for the believers listening here who uh, may have been Christians for many years and, uh, and yet the gospel paradigm over their over their lives is uh, perhaps dawning on them in fresh ways new ways exciting ways lord let it be let it bear fruit uh, we pray father that our hearts would grow in love for the saints of jesus christ and that our delight in your word would bring fruit of faithfulness and perseverance it's your help and strength uh, that grounds all of this. It's your son's perfect atoning work that is the ground of our justification and the hope for our future deliverance and resurrection from the dead. We thank you for what Christ has done, that Jesus is Lord. Help that not to be merely a confession of our lips. Help it to be the overflow of our lives as we want to be those directed by the good news who believe it, not just when we're saved, but who keep believing it, who persevere in faith, who don't shift from the gospel, who remain steadfast, and who stand in this grace. Lord, we know we are not perfect disciples. We know that the only kind of disciples you have are imperfect disciples. This, this brings great comfort to our hearts because it reminds us that our security is found in Christ alone, in his perfect righteousness, in our unbreakable union with him. Lord, may you bring us assurance and comfort with this news today. We pray this in his name and by the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen. We've been talking with Mitch Chase about his book, The Gospel is for Christians, and uh, it's a great resource. He's a kindred brother. I can tell you right now, he's a good friend now. We're, we just, just met today, but uh, I can say this is the guy that I can, uh, I can get behind and support in the work of what we're trying to accomplish together for the kingdom of God uh, to make the gospel known and to, to make that well known to believers so that we can live it out and, and preach it to ourselves on a regular basis. I cannot emphasize how important that is. And it's, it's, a, it's really what we try to do every day here with our ministry. And I'm sure uh, this book will be a benefit to you and everyone who reads it. I get a copy of it for get a couple of them, <laughs> hand them out to friends and, and family and start Bible studies on this subject. I'm sure that everyone will be richly blessed. If you'd like to find out more information, uh, please visit our website at songtime.com or give us a call. It's 508-362-7070. And of course, uh, all of these uh, details are available on our social media as well. So uh, Mitch, thank you so much for being a part of the many voices for that one message and for making us more aware of what it truly means to preach the gospel to ourselves and to hold to this gospel as Christians. Thank you, Adam. It's been my joy. Thank you, brother.